I'm back from the Southern California Linux Expo or SCALE and a lot has happened since the last episode. So let's jump right into your weekly source for Linux good news because, well, there's so much to talk about. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit, Linode, and Bitwarden. Speaking of scale, let's start off the show with a look back at Scale 20X. If you want a full breakdown of the conference, then you'll find a link in the show notes for the Destination Linux episode where we covered the event and our experience attending that event. Now, this year was my second year to attend Scale, and this was so different from last year in a lot of ways. There was at least twice as many people attending this year and more booths as well. Scale last year was a lot of fun in Los Angeles, but this year was a whole other experience in Pasadena. There were workshops, talks, a massive exhibit hall, and even Tux Digital had a booth in the exhibit hall where we got to meet and talk to a lot of people, and it was so much fun. In fact, we did a giveaway for a System76 launch keyboard, and that was a lot of fun too, especially because the person who won never had used a mechanical keyboard before, so we got to introduce them to the wonderful world of mechanical keyboards, so that was great. And also, what better way to do it than a System76 giveaway? And there was the one downside. And well, because scale was so massive, there was so little time for me to go to talk, so I missed a lot of the talks that I wanted to attend. But there's a bright side to that though, because all of those videos have been uploaded to the Scale YouTube channel, so anyone who wants to check those out and wasn't able to attend can do so now. I also recommend the keynote by Ken Thompson, who was one of the creators of Unix. He gave a keynote at the end of the conference, which was really interesting. Now, anyway, I, I wanna thank the awesome team of volunteers that helped make Scale happen because it was a great event. And also a special thanks to the company Linbit for sponsoring Tux Digital to attend Scale this year. And I can't wait to go back next year. And I hope to see you all of there as well next year because it's going to be a lot of fun. And I can guarantee you that because, well, I've been there twice now and both times were awesome. The GNOME team have released the latest major version of their desktop environment with GNOME 44. This release is not a big game changer as some of the past few releases have been, but this version does include some quality of life improvements for GNOME users. So for example, this release sees improvements to the login screen and lock screens to enhance the presentation for users. There's some new blur effects and just it looks overall much better. And one of the biggest changes in GNOME 44 is the introduction of the new background app section of the quick settings menu. Now this means that some applications will report they are running in the background and will be able to be closed directly from this menu. Now this is far from a system tray with app indicators that people have been begging GNOME to bring back for about a decade, but I guess it's better than nothing, I suppose. So, you know, the downside of this is that it, this new feature only is compatible with the API that makes it possible. So all the applications that you want to be in the system tray are not gonna support this, at least not for a while, if ever, unfortunately, but you know, at least they're doing something. But let's get back to the highlights, shall we? GNOME 44 introduces a lot of improvements to the quick settings menu, which is the menu at the top right of the interface. They have greatly improved the functionality with the Bluetooth devices, making it really easy to quickly connect or disconnect devices. Pairing new devices is still done in the main settings app, but if you switch between various Bluetooth devices like I do, then you will certainly appreciate this update. The quick settings menu also has been redesigned a bit to take up more horizontal space rather than vertical space, which I like and it also improves the look and feel of the menu as well. And the GNOME team have also redesigned the accessibility page in the settings and added an option to enable over amplification for volume control, which is very important to a lot of people. And finally, there is one feature that people have been requesting for years. And finally, it is included in GNOME 44. GNOME has added support for thumbnails in the file picker. You may be thinking to yourself, is that really something notable? And the answer is, well, kinda yes. GNOME is a great desktop made by a lot of talented people, but there's quite a few things that the GNOME project and the GNOME developers are in a disagreement with the GNOME user community. And are, well, actually, in a way, you could say they're completely at odds over some stuff. So it's notable when these things change for the betterment of user experience. So I wanted to bring that up as a highlight because I appreciate them listening to the community. It's essentially something that should be a standard feature, but you know, up until now, it wasn't part of GNOME and now it is. 
which is always great to see developers provide functionality the community wants. Now, if only we can get a system tray, I'd be super happy about that. If you'd like to learn more about the latest release of GNOME with GNOME 44, you'll find links in the show notes. Recently, Red Hat celebrated their 30th anniversary, and I just wanted to take a moment on this show to basically celebrate this and also thank them for all of the work that they have done over the years. Red Hat has been an amazing member of the open source and Linux community for decades now, providing so many critical pieces of technology I mean, that we all use and enjoy and perhaps even take for granted at times. I'm talking about things like Pulse Audio or Pipewire, System D, SE Linux, RPM, as well as being a major contributor to the Xorg display server and the Linux kernel itself, and many, many more. Red Hat has done so much for the Linux ecosystem that it's really impossible for me to list all the stuff here because then I would just be dedicating the entire episode listing off everything that they have done because there's just so much of it. But if you're interested in learning out more about what they do and what they've done over the years, there's actually a link in the show notes that will tell you that. So thanks again to Red Hat and congratulations to 30 years of being awesome. I wanna thank Linbit for making it possible for me to go to scale 20X this year and do coverage of the event. We were able to get a lot of interviews from a bunch of different booths in addition to connecting with so many people there, including Linbit themselves, so thank you very much to the awesome people at Linbit for making it possible for myself and my fellow co-host of Destination Linux to attend Scale this year. And for those unfamiliar with Linbit, Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD high availability software that has been a part of the Linux kernel for many, many years. And Linbit stores the industry leading open source software defined storage system. Limbit is run by its founders to this day, and all of its engineers and developers are in-house, with offices in Europe and in North America. They offer 24-7 global support to complement their, their enterprise offerings, and Limbit has an active presence in the open source community, and they even collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features for their software. Limbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms, and without the vendor lock-in that is so common these days in technology. So that's amazing. And with DRBD and LinStore, you can have high-speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. All of these are available, and there's even DRBD proxy for long-distance replications. Visit linbit.com to learn more about the people behind Linbit and how they can be your open source partner for block storage and more. Kali Linux has released the latest version of this ethical hacking and penetration testing distro, and this marks an important milestone for the project, as Kali Linux is celebrating their 10th anniversary. Kali Linux 2023.1 introduces a new var a variant of the project called Kali Purple, which has a focus on defensive security. Kali Linux is most known for the offensive security features that it offers and the tools that it offers, but with this new variant, it will now offer defensive tools to cover all bases. Kali Purple comes with more than 100 defensive tools like the Archime Full Packet Capture and Analysis, Cyber Chef, Cyber Swiss Army Knife, the Elastic Security Information and Event Management, GVM Vulnerability Scanner, and much more. To quote the Kali Linux team, they said, remember what we did a decade ago with Kali Linux or with Backtrack before that? We made offensive security accessible to everyone. No expensive licenses required, no need for commercial grade infrastructure and no writing code or completing or compiling tools to make it all work. We're, we are now excited to start a new journey with a mission to do exactly the same for defensive security, end quote. Kali Linux 2023.1 also comes with some updates of various packages, including desktop environments such as XFCE 4.18 and KDE Plasma 5.27 LTS. There are also some improvements and updates to Kali's NetHunter branch for mobile devices and much, much more. If you'd like to learn more about the latest release of Kali Linux or just Kali Linux in general, then you'll find links in the show notes. And also quick note for those who are curious, if you are new to Kali Linux, it is not for daily drivers. It's for people who are tr trying to get into the security world of computing. And if you are just using it because you think it might will protect you or that sort of thing, or it's just cool, think about something else because it's not really designed for that. Ubuntu 23.04 is right around the corner and recently they released the beta versions of 
the 23.04 release or Lunar Lobster, and the Ubuntu flavors as well. If you'd like to test it out before release, then you'll find links in the show notes, but remember this is a beta release, so keep that in mind while trying it out. Since this is a beta release, I'm not gonna go into a huge amount of detail on this release just yet because I will just you know, save that for the final release that's coming later in the month. But a few highlights for prop Ubuntu proper is upgrading to GNOME 44, being powered by the Linux 6.2 kernel, features a new desktop installer, an updated Ubuntu font, it has Mesa 23 graphics drivers that are included by default, and much more. Again, be sure to subscribe to This Week in Linux podcast to stay up to date on all things Linux and to find out all the good stuff coming in Ubuntu 23.04, because we'll be taking a deep dive into that as well as the Ubuntu flavors. Speaking of Ubuntu flavors, we have a new option for flavors. And for those who are not aware, Ubuntu has many different flavors to choose from. So if you the default Unity-like GNOME experience isn't for you, then there are plenty of other options. And recently, Canonical announced that another remix will now become an official flavor of Ubuntu with a next cycle of 23.04. And that is Ubuntu Cinnamon, which is great to see because the Ubuntu flavors growing is always good, but also because this will be the first flavor which name includes an actual flavor. Is this even remotely important to the topic to include? Well, no, of course not, but it does amuse me, so I wanted to point that out. Also, Ubuntu Cinnamon is a flavor of Ubuntu that provides the Cinnamon desktop environment out of the box, as you might imagine. For those unfamiliar with the Cinnamon desktop, well, it's a desktop experience that comes with the Linux Mint team. Uh, it was actually developed by the Linux Mint team, uh, though some users prefer a more vanilla experience when they talk about using Ubuntu versus how Linux Mint does the approach. But, you know, either recipe you go with, cinnamon is a great addition to your recipe. And Ubuntu cinnamon becoming an official flavor will make it even more appetizing. This is also good news that the official flavor designation is happening this cycle because they will be able to meet the two non-LTS release requirements in order to participate in the next LTS release next year for 2404. So that is good timing for them. If you'd like to learn more about Ubuntu Cinnamon or the Cinnamon desktop in general, you'll find links in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Linode. Visit linode.com slash tux. That's linode.com slash T-U-X. And see why over a million developers trust Linode for their infrastructure. Linode provides solutions and services to accelerate innovation, whether you want to do that yourself by building everything yourself, or you want to use one-click apps from their plethora of options in Linode's app marketplace, you can do all of this. And the marketplace is fantastic. You can deploy everything from Plesk and WordPress to Valheim and Minecraft servers really quick and easily. Linode even has VPN-friendly virtual servers, so you can create secure connections over the internet protecting you on public Wi-Fi. So if you want to go to a cafe and connect to it, which you might not want to anyway, but this way you could have protection from malware and attacks and stuff like that. And if that wasn't enough, every plan comes with Linode's awesome human-powered customer support. You might, I mean, Why do you say human-powered? Well, this is this thing that they do that's kind of crazy. I know it's going to blow your mind probably. And that is if you call them, a human picks up the phone. And if you send them an email, a human responds to that email. Or you can send them a message on social media and the human will reply on social media 24-7, 365. I know it's crazy, but that's how they do it. And that's awesome, right? So visit lenodecom slash tux to create your free account. Plus, when you use that URL, you'll let them know that we sent you, which is, of course, good for us, but also good for you because you're going to get a $100 free credit when you go to lenodecom slash tux and get that 60-day $100 free credit right now by going to lenodecom slash tux and signing up on their awesome cloud platform. Triscoll 11 has been released and is based on Ubuntu 22.04 LTS, but it's also quite different from most distributions based on Ubuntu. Triscoll is different because it is one of the few actual forks of Ubuntu. Most of the time when a distro is based on Ubuntu, it still uses the Ubuntu infrastructure in some way or another, making it simply a derivative or a remix rather than a fork. Of course, Ubuntu is the basis, so it still starts from Ubuntu, but then the Triscoll team does their thing. You see, Triscoll's goal is to provide an Ubuntu-based distro that does not offer proprietary components, and because of this, it is FSF certified. You can decide for yourself whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Now, Triscoll 11 uses the Linux Libre 5.15 kernel and the Mate desktop for the user experience, though they do offer another addition for those who are wanting to use the KDE Plasma desktop, which is Triscoll, 
with a K. Now, Trisco 11 also contains a lot of modifications, including the removal of the Snap-based Firefox package and instead replacing it with the A browser, which is essentially a debranded version of Firefox. And if you like the idea of using an Ubuntu-based distro but are looking for one that doesn't contain proprietary packages, then Trisco 11 might be something for you to have a look at. And if so, you'll find links at the show notes. At the show notes? In the show notes. You would imagine I've said this so many hundreds of times that I would not mess that up, but apparently... Apparently I will. The Framework Laptop is a very cool piece of kit that many Linux geeks can't wait to get their hands on. And that of course includes me. Framework has been making some really cool laptops for a couple of years now, and they have made a few changes to their lineup recently that has many people yelling at them to take their money. For those unfamiliar with the Framework Laptop, it is a modular and upgradable laptop that has a lot of open source components and makes it possible for people to make upgrades to their laptop easily and quickly, which is completely unheard of these days. I mean, recently, Framework has even introduced a new version with AMD-powered model of their laptop, which has been something many people have been wanting since the initial launch. And I think they've already sold out of them, or at least had a lot of people order them. And now these Framework laptops also come with the AMD Ryzen 70 40 series processor, and comes with an upgradable motherboard just like the Intel powered laptops. Yes, this even means you can take the motherboard out of an existing framework laptop that came with the Intel version and replace it with the new AMD compatible motherboard, which gives you the AMD version. Very, very cool. Framework is just so cool. Now, Framework also announced many other things, including new models in their lineup and more at their next level event. And I highly recommend checking out the latest episode of Destination Linux because all of that was covered on that show. So if you are interested to learn more about the Framework lineup and all the cool stuff that's come out, then be sure to check the links in the show notes for the latest episode of Destination Linux. The UV Ports team have announced the latest version of Ubuntu Touch. And this is a major milestone that has been in development for many years now. So it was great to finally see it coming to the community. Now, Ubuntu Touch Focal OTA1 has been released. Don't let that OTA1 part throw you though, because it is certainly not the first release of Ubuntu Touch, but rather the first release of the Focal branch of the project. This means that Ubuntu Touch is now based on a later version of Ubuntu Core packages, with now supporting the base of Ubuntu 20.04 LTS. This is great because it means a lot of progress has been made on the underlying components of this mobile operating system, and that means better momentum moving forward. Now, the current Ubuntu LTS is 22.04, and the current version of Ubuntu Touch is being based on 20.04, which may seem less important because of it not being the latest LTS, but this is a big deal because the previous version of Ubuntu Touch was based on Ubuntu 16.04 LTS, so this move took a lot of work including lots of stuff like the init system and so much more. And I hope this means that future base upgrades will be even easier, but we'll have to wait and see there. But for now, Ubuntu Touch Focal OTA1 officially supports smartphone models like the Fairphone 4, Google Pixel 3a, a Volaphone, Volaphone 22, and the Volaphone X. There are other devices that have varied support, so you may need to look it up and see what your device has current status for Ubuntu Touch. In addition to rebasing to Ubuntu 20.04 LTS, the new Ubuntu Touch release is aiming for Android 9 Plus based devices. It switched from Upstart to SystemD, moved from Anbox to Wadroid, and has adapted many of its components to be able to be built under GCC 12 and Qt 5.15. Now the, the GCC 12 and Qt 5.15 work is for more future proofing to prepare Ubuntu Touch to move forward for future Ubuntu LTS version updates. And one last thing, I'd like to request that the Ubuntu Touch team add a more clear versioning system instead of these OTA labels, because it threw me at first when there is a OTA 25 and an OTA 1 being released. So like maybe a 3.x or whatever instead. Just a thought. If you'd like to learn more about Ubuntu Touch, then you'll find links in the show notes. This episode of This Week in Linux is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get started right now with your free account at bitwarden.com slash tux. Bitwarden is an awesome piece of software. It is a password manager that allows you to have peace of mind knowing that your online accounts are secure. How does it do that? 
Well, Bitwarden provides you with tools to store all of your passwords in a secured vault, auto-generate those passwords for you, and even automatically fill in those passwords on login forms so you don't have to do any of this stuff. Plus, they've added support for automatically generating usernames to get a combination of not having to worry about your passwords or your usernames anymore, which is fantastic. And you can access your data across many different types of devices, whether it's your web browser, mobile application, desktop application, or even on the command line. Bitwarden gives you access to all of that. Plus, Bitwarden seals and encrypts your private data with end-to-end encryption before it ever leaves your devices. So you know you're the only person with access to your data, which is really important for a password manager. And it's one of the reasons why I love Bitwarden and why I have been using it for years. So go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get started. Did I mention you get started for free? Well, you can, but I think you want to check out their premium account because you get so much stuff for less than a dollar per month. That's right. For only $10 per year, you get one gigabyte of encrypted file storage, two-step login with YubiKey, U2F Duo, Vault Health Reports, Bitwarden Authenticator for temporary one-time passwords, priority customer service, and so much more. And all of this for less than a dollar per month. So make the smart move like many community have and go to bitwarden.com slash tux to get your account today. There is a new release of a distro designed for administrating and repairing computer systems and rescuing data. This distro is called System Rescue. System Rescue is based on Arch Linux, so it has a lot of up-to-date packages, though not the latest and greatest as a distro like this doesn't really need bleeding edge editions of the packages. Now, System Rescue 10 comes with the Linux kernel 6.1, which is the current LTS version of the kernel. There's also added the Grub loopback config support, added boot customization hooks for Grub and SysLinux, added GUI auto start YAML configuration to run programs when X window is started, and much, much more. System Rescue 10.0 can be used directly from the command line or with the XFCE desktop, and in this case, it's been updated to XFCE 4.18. If you'd like to learn more about System Rescue or give it a spin for yourself, then you'll find links in the show notes. Amazon has announced the latest release of their in-house Linux distribution with Amazon Linux 2023 for those using AWS. Now, to be clear, Amazon Linux is made exclusively for use on AWS, so it's not likely they're going to be providing any ISO for people to install locally on their own machines, but it is still a very notable release because they revealed something that I think is pretty cool, that they have rebased their, their distro on top of Fedora Linux. Previous versions of Amazon Linux were made from a multi multiple upstream source system, and Amazon was not really quick to explain much about how it was made in the past, but this time around they have publicly noted that the distro is based on Fedora, though they also mentioned that it's not in directly compatible with any particular release of Fedora. Now, Amazon Linux 2023 features boot speed optimizations. SE Linux is enabled by default. It includes support for OpenSSL 3. It uses XFS as the root file system and also includes security enhancements and quality of life improvements for AWS customers. So if you are a customer on AWS, then you may be interested in learning more about this. And if so, you'll find links in the show notes. Are you in the market for a free and open source and cross-platform accounting software? then you may want to check out the latest release of GNU Cache, with GNU Cache 5.0 being released. Highlights of GNU Cache 5.0 include a new stock transaction assistant that can be accessed from the Actions menu to help guide you through entering most investment transactions from uh, bonds, mutual funds, and stocks. 5.0 also introduces an investment lots report that displays a graph of capital gains and losses in a period by investment lot and many, many other changes. Now, I've tried GNU Cash out in the past and learned it wasn't really for me. It didn't really fit my needs from a financial application standpoint, but it might be the perfect fit for you. So if you are curious about GNU Cash 5.0 and what it offers, then you'll find links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show and want to keep up to date with what's going on in the Linux world, then be sure to subscribe and, of course, remember to like that smash button. And if you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash contribute, where you get a bunch of cool stuff like access to patron-only sections of our Discord server and much, much more. Because by becoming a patron of this show, you're actually becoming a patron of the entire network and you get a ton of really cool stuff. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt that I'm currently wearing right now 
on the Tux Digital store by going to tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, you can check out all the other great stuff we have like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and so much more. Go to tuxdigital.com slash store. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell with the Tux Digital Network, and I'll see you next week for another episode of your weekly source for Linux. Good news. Actually, it's going to be sooner than next week because we're going to start up the whole weekly process thing this week again. So, just a few days technically.